One of the things people often comment on is one of my hobbies is, um, is aviation. And I, I built my own airplane and I fly it around. Probably, and uh, people ask, how's that going? And I'm saying, well, I'm still here. So obviously it's working okay so far. So um, my background, I started as a product manager in my career um, back in, with Hewlett Packard. It was mentioned before as one of the premier companies that started the whole concept of product management. And they had this concept of management by objectives where they give product managers objectives. And they used to call the product manager your own CEO. And I quickly learned that wasn't really true as, as Promote pointed out, you know, a CEO has some authority, and the definition of a product manager is responsibility without authority. And, and those two words are the key words. I mean, you had a great list of, of attributes, but those two words you have to keep in mind all the time. You, you, you are basically responsible for the lifeblood of a company, which is the product direction, and yet you really have no authority to get anything done, right? And I'm going to talk today about how that can lead you down the wrong path and I talk about roadmaps, the fastest route to the wrong destination, about how the roadmap can sort of be your enemy as a product manager and leading the company down the wrong path and give some ideas on, on how to work around that. So I'm going to start with a really bold statement here. Most products fail. This isn't just small companies. This is small, big, any size company. All these research studies have gone out there and found that the majority of products actually fail. And what do I mean by fail? I don't mean a smoking crater. I mean that you originally had this idea as a product manager, and you have this business plan you propose for it, the accountant side of things, and at the end of the day, it doesn't achieve that number or anywhere near that number. And I think most CEOs and, and product managers I talk to agree with this statement, that most products do fail. So how do we, as product managers, stop being one of the statistics here of failed products? So the first thing we've got to do is figure out why. Why, why do most products fail? And, and we'll, I'm going to go through a bunch of examples here of failed products. Um, this is back when, when NASA was going into space. They discovered that regular ballpoint pens don't work. So they went to a company called Fisher, and they said, we need to have something we can write with in space. And they spent a million dollars and came up with a version of a pen with a pressurized capsule inside of it so it could write upside down. Of course, the Russians just brought a pencil, right? <laughs> just an example of not understanding your market. Another one, I don't know how many people are old enough to remember the concept of the Betamax and the VHS. And if, if, you, if you're too young to know that, this is a good story of understanding your market and not just your customer. Sony had the system called Betamax. It was the first video recorder that came in a portable format that consumers could buy. And it had amazing specs for the day. It was better than normal VHS tapes, which was the competitor, by higher resolution, better color palette. Everything was great. The cassette was even smaller. But it, and it also recorded for one hour. And no one thought that was a problem until someone realized that movies are two hours long. And VHS came along with this inferior technology in every measure of the sense. It was inferior, except it recorded for two hours, and they licensed it to everybody else as opposed to keeping it proprietary. And you went into a store, and you saw eight VHS machines and one Sony machine. And this one could record movies, and this one couldn't. But this one was a lot better. Who do you think won? Out of business in a few years, and VHS cornered the market. Now, you probably have to be an American to understand this. Smith & Wesson is a gun manufacturer in the United States, and they decided they wanted to get in the bicycle business because they thought, what the heck? You know, we have a well-known brand. And of course, the only people who bought this bike were policemen. <laughs> Maybe if they put a gun rack on the, on the back, it could have sold in a broader market. Um, Lifesavers is a candy in America, and they thought they could be in the soft drink business. And if they had done a little bit of market research, they would have realized that the brand was associated with candy, not soft drinks. And no one ever bought it because they assumed that the soft drink just tasted like candy. Ben Gay aspirin, right? Ben Gay is something you rub on yourself and it smells really bad and supposedly it makes you feel better. So who wants to have stinky aspirin? Not very successful product. Frito-Lay makes chips in the United States. They decided, well, everyone usually when they have chips, they have a drink, so let's sell lemonade. Again, not understanding the, the market, the brand, 
all the things associated with their product, they had, it's called hubris, right? They had the assumption that we could do anything we, we set our mind to. And again, another huge failure. This one is a Swedish weapons manufacturer who decided they could get in the toothpaste business. What were they thinking, right? And yet, obviously, when you get inside the, the, the four walls of the company and you get your blinders on and you think you can do anything, you make decisions like that. Colgate, also another toothpaste company, decided to get in the food business. You know, brush while you eat. What a great concept. <laughs> Not, again, another failure. And a finally, <laughs> enough said, right? Branding problems. What else can you say? McDonald's tried to say, well, gee, maybe our customers want our hamburgers in two parts, the bun in one side and the meat on the other, and they could assemble it themselves. Again, missing the whole point of fast food, right? I don't want to go through the effort of assembling my meal. I just want to eat it. Didn't understand their market, didn't understand their customers. And these are all huge companies making huge mistakes in the market. And of course, after the fact, with 2020 hindsight, you know, a motorcycle company putting out perfume, you know, just what a girl wants, a guy who smells like motor oil, right? Why are we failing so much, right? Why, why as product managers do we fail so much? And I was there too. I've had my share of failed products as well. How do we, how do we stop failing so much so we don't, you know, be, become just another statistic? You know, a joke I heard sort of describes it a little bit is, you know, two people walk in a room and one other person walks in the room with, money and the other person walks in the room with experience and when they walk out of the room the person with the money will leave with experience and the person with experience will leave with the money right and so what i'm trying to say with that story a little bit is that what you've got to do is benefit you've got to benefit from experience not think you know the answer walking in the room you've got to do more homework to validate your ideas even though you think and know you're right because I bet you all of the three quarters of failed products all started with product managers who knew they were right. And yet, three out of four times, they were wrong. So why do we make the wrong decisions, right? Well, the first one I'd like to say is product managers aren't trained to be product managers. Who, who in this room has a degree in product management from college? There is no such degree. And yet, every other position in the enterprise they all have degrees. Engineers have degrees in engineering. The accountants have degrees in accountants. Everyone has a degree in what they do except the product manager. And yet you're making the most important decisions there. And usually product managers came out of some other field. You were an engineer. You maybe were in marketing. And therefore, you had to learn on the job. You know, and only the very biggest companies and very few of them actually train their product managers. Usually, it's trial by fire. Here, here's the job. Go learn from the other people doing the job. And by the way, I'm not going to tell you that they're failing three quarters of the time. But go learn from them, right? There's too much data now, too many signals. You know, the, the internet is great, except it gives you too much information about making your decisions. And what we end up doing is we end up having to close ourselves off from a lot of the information that, that potentially could have helped us make a better decision in the first place. And you say, well, what? Aren't there tools out there to help me? There's Jira and AHA and Excel and all these tools. And I kiddingly say, all those products do is help you build the wrong product better and faster. They don't help you make the right decision in the first place about what you need to build. They're all about process. And I'm not to say those are bad products. They're good products but they only help on the process, and the process is broken. And that's why we're making so many failed products out there. We actually did some research on 2,200 companies. We found that 86% of product managers do no market research. And we asked them why, and they said, well, we don't know how. We weren't trained to be researchers. But we do talk to customers. I'm going, well, Market research isn't just talking to customers. That's a little piece of it. We'll talk about that when we get there, why that's just a small piece of it. But beyond talking to customers, the majority don't do real market research. And digital transformation, we all talk about that, right? It's making it even harder. All we're doing is failing faster right now because of, of all the data flooding us and the, the, how rapidly we now have to make decisions it just makes the problem worse. So, how do you increase your product success? 
Well, there's three, three steps, and I, I'm going I'm to focus on companies that already have products, not necessarily startups, right? Startup is a different issue. You come in with a passion. It's, it's often hard to market research something that nobody has ever seen before, although it can be done. It's a, it's a bigger challenge to do. I'm going to focus on what most people hear is you, you're a company, you have a product, and you want to keep your product current, which means you've got a thousand features chasing that next release, and you as the product manager have to triage that number down to the 10 that are gonna make it in that next release. How do you do that? How do you do that part of your job? That's what we're gonna focus on today. So there's three steps. There's assessment, correction, and then what I'm gonna say is you have to transform the process because we have a broken process if three quarters of the time we're failing. So first step, assessment. And again, we should be doing this every day as product people, right? How, first of all, how are you measuring your success? What is your measurement system? And unless you're across your organization, you have a common measurement system that each product manager is going to be measuring things against their own system of measurement, you know, as John said, based on their own past experience. And we're going to be comparing apples and oranges, especially if you're the person having to decide amongst all these competing product managers what we're going to do as a company. Are your products meeting your customer and company objectives? Again, what are the objectives? That's how you measure, right? And then finally, how do you compare in the marketplace? You know, where, where is your competitive position? So once you've done those steps, the second step is how do you correct, right? And it depends on how far course, off course you are. I've seen many companies that are way off course. You know, they're, they're, on, they're on the path to failure, and, and often they don't realize it. You know, someone once said, you know, if you jump off a mountain, at first you maybe think you're flying until the ground starts getting close really fast. And then you finally realize that, you know, you're in free fall. But for a while, you probably think you're okay that you're flying. And a lot of companies just don't see that. They don't see that they're way off course. So, you know, if you've determined this, if you're slightly off course, that's probably the best place to be. Every company I've ever seen is always slightly off course. Why? Because the market's constantly moving. And when you first design the product, by the t to the time you introduce it, the market has probably moved already, which means you've got to keep it on course continuously. You know, one of the things I like to tell people is that you need to be the first person to obsolete your own products. Don't wait for your competitors to do it. You do it. There should be a healthy competition in everyone's organization to be obsoleting your products rather than trying to preserve what you've got. You know, too many people hang on for too long to the, quote, old product line when the market has shifted, rather than being the person that obsoletes your own product first. So these small adjustments are good. They keep your product lines, you know, on course. But it's hard because, as I said, most companies I, I know, we, we just introduced a product a month ago. We already have 100 feature ideas on our backlog. And we're small. Uh, the company I was with before, it's a slightly bigger company, they were a $20 million company. We had 3,500 items in the backlog. Unmanageable, right? And trying to triage all that down to the next release, even though they're small adjustments, that's how companies start to get off course. They make the wrong decisions about how they stay on course. So let's say you've made some of those wrong decisions and you're moderately off course, right? You can apply Band-Aids, facelift, there's, this is, a, this is a hard place to be, because if you're moderately off course, it means your, pro your process is probably broken to get you that far off course. And getting back on course can be pretty challenging. And finally, if you're way off course, you know, maybe you need to acquire a whole new product line. You know, big companies tend to acquire products because that's the fastest way to obsolete their own product by buying someone else who's already obsoleted them. It's not a bad strategy, but it also tells you, gee, you should be asking the question, how did we get so far off course that we have to buy somebody to stay on course? It reminds me of the three envelope story. I don't know if you've heard the three envelope story. This, this is the, a, a CEO comes in to start a new job. His predecessor had just been fired and the predecessor shakes his hand and says, I've left three envelopes in the drawer for you. And he says, each time you run into a crisis, grab an envelope. They're numbered one, two, three. So three months after the CEO gets there, something really bad happens. And he opens the first envelope, and it says, blame your predecessor. So he goes out and he blames his predecessor. Great, everything's back on course again. Three months later, there's another huge crisis happens. He opens the second envelope, right? And that envelope, it says, blame the economy. So he goes out and he blames the economy, right? It works. 
three months later, another crisis hits. He opens the third envelope. It says, prepare three envelopes. <laughs> the most important thing you can do, though, in your organization is to transform the product process. Because in most organizations, it's ad hoc at best. So we actually have systems in organization for the bottom line and for the top line, right? We all have those systems in our companies to manage all that. Where is the system for our product line, right? Why don't we have systems to manage our product line the same way we manage the back end or the front end? Because this drives everything. If you get this wrong, none of that stuff really matters at the end of the day, because you're going to have another failure. So how do we get away from opinions and improvised tools and bespoken processes, which is how we do it now, to really have a product line process? Well, the way to do that, I'm going to say, is to develop what I call a market-first approach of how you approach product management. And it, de it demands you, you look at the market in a broader way you've done before. We, we've all heard of product, for, right, product market fit. How many have heard that? We all talk. Everyone says product market fit. Those are the wrong words. They're backwards. It's market product fit. You know, too many times we have a product, we're trying to figure out how to get it to fit our market. We should be looking at the market and figuring out how to get our product to fit the market in the first place. It sounds subtle, but it's very important, different way of thinking about things. It's about thinking about your market. We've all been trained to be customer focused. And I'm going to tell you that's, frankly, a really narrow view of the world. Because I know whenever I've had customers and I go and sell them a product and I have a certain value proposition that, that got them to buy my product in the first place, and then a year later I go to them and say, what do you think about my product? They've typically forgotten why they bought it and they're going to sit there and complain about day to day what they don't like about your product. And if I just focused on fixing those things, I'm not going to make my market any bigger because I've lost the, my focus on the value proposition that made them buy in the first place. And sometimes those are very different stories in order to get you there. And we need to understand those nuances. The other thing I heard is that, you know, about customer-driven focus is the, bar, the uh, NPS, Net Promoter Score, right? We all know about that, right? And some companies do a better job of understanding that. But someone went out and studied the Net Promoter Score, and that's asking the question of your customers is, would you recommend our product or company to other people? Yes or no, give me a scale, right? And you get a score. And somehow that's a measure of how good a company you are and whether you're going to grow or not. And so finally, someone actually went, did some research on this and found out, this is a, a, a university, they actually tracked customers' responses on that and then figured out how much more of a company's product did they buy over time based on the net promoter score. And they found virtually no correlation. That is, a high net promoter or low didn't matter. They still got about the same amount of revenue from the uh, increase in revenue from those customers because it's all about increasing revenue from customers or renewals. But at the net, net end of the day, you want to increase your revenue. And they, they couldn't figure out why. And so the, what they did is they came up with some other questions and went out and researched those. And what they found is the question that mattered was not whether you'd recommend it to somebody, but whether you liked it yourself. And they asked the question, what do you think? Do you value our product? And that corresponded directly with how much more product people were going to buy from you. So the recommendation is we can't get away from that promoter score because it's become folklore. I mean, you have to do it. But I recommend to all of you ask a second question. How much do you like our product? Is it satisfying your needs? Are you satisfied? Because that's going to be the measure of whether your business is, is, is on track with your customers. But the other nuance about customers came, came about is that a, another study follow on to that looked at what two different kinds of companies that use the data from the customers about what did you like and dislike about our product. And customers would have a list of things they liked and a customer things, the things they disliked. And the companies that focused on the things they disliked and making those better was one approach. So they said, look, I love how you do this and I hate how you do this. You know, couldn't you make this better? And the other kind of company said, I'm going to ignore the people who didn't like it. I'm going to take what they already love, and I'm going to make it even better. Who do you think did better in the marketplace? It wasn't even close. 
The customers that focused on listening to the customer complaints and fixing what the customer said was wrong did dramatically worse long term than the companies that went out and focused on what they did better, did best, and made it even better. And you say, well, that sounds counterintuitive. What, what's going on? Well, it turns out the things customers complained about were things that they already could do, but you could do it a little better for them. But the reason they love you is because you did a few things over here. They, there's no other way for them to do it. You, you're the only show in town, and they love you for that. And if you did that better, you're fending off your competition. Why? Because you're taking what you're strong at and making it so good that competitors can't get a foothold. The customers will tolerate the complaints, but they won't tolerate you be, not being the leader in what they love about your product. So what that tells you is, you know, customer-driven focus is not going to give you that answer. Market-driven focus gives you that answer about how do I do what I do well, do it even better. Go, I call it going deep versus broad. Deep is, unless you're so deep that there's, you're running out of innovation, then you can go broad. But until that's the case, put all your resources into going deep. It's going to make you more successful, faster than anything else you can do. The other thing is go from opinion-based decision-making, which we all do, to decisions based on market data. Again, I'll talk about tools and how you do that more, but that's critical as well. We have to become more data-driven as product managers. When you're in that room and the CEO says, no, you're wrong, I want to do this, do you have the data to back up why you're right? At your fingertips? Because unless you do, unless you do it at that meeting, you're going to lose the battle. We call it the, the battle of the biggest, the biggest wallet, right? Whoever has the highest paycheck in that room usually wins the battle. How do you beat that syndrome? You do it with data. You do it with facts. You do it with saying, you know, if we did that, here's what it's going to cost us. In real time, you know that answer immediately, right? That's how you win that, 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 that conversation, because you're not going to have the biggest paycheck, but you can have the most data in your head in that room. And, of course, ad hoc product management, data-driven product validation. That's a word I want to get driven in everyone's brain here, validation. It's all about validating what you think. And the reason, the reason we fail so much is we don't have the tools or techniques or expertise to do validation well enough. So how do we do that better? So the principles of a market-first approach is Market signals come from multiple sources. Non-customers, most important thing. Th that's how you expand your market, is by talking to the people who don't own your product. And we don't do that enough. Also customers, but also internal teams. Talk to your sales department. Survey them. Survey your technical support folks. Survey your marketing people. Each of these people and constituencies have a different point of view that you have to take into account in order to validate whether you're right or wrong. What is your competition doing? All those things will give you an idea. And by the way, don't assume your competition is right. <laughs> They're going to fail three out of four times too. Right? That's not the answer to keep up with the competition or to go to the direction they have. That takes fortitude and leadership, which you were talking about, which Promote was talking about, all those other skills that, that take courage. But the courage needs to be based on data, real data, from all the different constituencies it takes to make a decision. And again, it's all about data. So I, I, an analogy I like to use to people about product management is, we all know about the sales funnel, right? We all live and breathe that Salesforce sort of memorialize that. And then, you know, companies like Marketo gave us the marketing funnel. We need a feature funnel, right? This is our job. We start with 10,000 ideas, and we get down to 10 things that make it in the plan. How do we manage that funnel? Most companies I know manage it with an Excel spreadsheet with what I call the P factor, right? There's a, it's called the priority. And the P1s make the release, and the P2, 3, 4, 5s just stay in the backlog forever. And that's sort of the level of resolution of the data that you walk into that meeting with when the CEO says, I want you to do that P4 right there. Sorry, it's an order, right? And unless you can know, well, if I do the P4, which of my P0s are going to drop off the list? Do you have that answer immediately? And do you know the cost of that? Do you know why the one that's dropping off? And do you need to have a way to defend why the P4 that, he, that that person wants is not the one you should do? 
You know, unless you can do that, you don't have your data either in hand or well analyzed. So how do you do this? You know, what is a good process? We're going to talk about a process to do that. So the first thing you need is you need a system to capture ideas and feature requests and organize them in a structured fashion. There's plenty of products out there that are ideation products, right? They solicit ideas, and most product managers go, I don't need more ideas. But you do need more ideas, right? Because out of this mine is going to come some diamonds every once in a while, right? And it's your job to look for that. Because as product managers, we're generally not inventors. We usually get ideas from other places, and we refine those ideas to become products. That's our job, right? The scientists are the inventors. But ideas come from any place. You don't know where they come from. So you've got to have a system to organize your ideas in a structured fashion, you know, and to process them and triage them to say which of these ideas actually should finally make it to be a feature in my product. So the other thing is, how do you weigh these things? And we, call, we say you have to develop a common currency to evaluate your features. One of the challenges we see in organizations with multiple product managers is each product manager has a different system that they use to evaluate features of what the things they think are important. And this is the biggest mistake you make in a company. Because what you need is a common set of these values that everybody has agreed on, and it's driven from the top down. The concept of what we call corporate drivers, and often those are your, your KPIs. What do we care about? If I'm a SaaS company, I care about annual recurring revenue, monthly recurring revenue. I care about churn rate, right? If I'm a large company, you know, like Sabre, you mentioned, I, I care about how difficult is this to maintain as an idea, as an example. Will this expand my market? Does this enhance my brand, for example? Those are corporate drivers. And you should have a set of five or six at the most that everybody agrees are how we're going to weigh our, our features against. And then each product line probably has its own set of drivers. So for example, in this case, um, we created an example of a company that's uh, a reservation system for consumers, right? We call, and this is a feature they're considering called Dine with Friends. And uh, the product people care about scalability, which is customers don't care about that, but a product person cares about that. Time to value, how soon will the customer get value using this feature? How does it compare to my competition? How much user delight does it give? And how about performance on the system? Does it affect that? Of course, that feature has no effect on performance, but it's really big on user delight. It's going to give me a big competitive advantage. Time to value, yep, the people will see more value if I have a feature that helps them pick restaurants with friends, but it doesn't help me on scalability. If we went to the corporate drivers for the same feature, it's very little contribution to revenue. I, don't, I think it might help, but I'm not sure right now. Um, doesn't help me acquire more restaurants. Helps me acquire more diners. Helps me keep the diners engaged, maybe a little bit less. And doesn't help me on my other corporate goal of internationalization. Right? This is just an example of, the, of a set of drivers that this company developed and how it evaluates a feature. And as a product manager, this sort of gives you a higher level of resolution to think about the things that drive your feature. And each of your features that are in the funnel should have this similar kind of analysis performed on them so that you can compare them on similar ways of measuring features. Because it's, once you get beyond 10 features, it's too complicated to do it in your head or even with Excel. You need a way to value and compare features. And this is an iterative process, by the way. This starts with the product manager spending two minutes creating these values to then doing some market research on the feature and going back, you know, I talked to, I went to some prospects and, you know, they, they told me it's really not going to help, you know, get them on board our system. So I'm going to lower that four down to a one because it's just not there. But what it did is it really delighted our folks that are currently on the system. I'm going to move that up. So what you do over time is you start to refine these values to get a better picture and view of that feature by doing targeted market research around this feature. The next thing you need to do is once you've done that with your features and gotten the values, what you're going to find is certain features in your backlog will, will bubble to the top because they will have the highest values. And one of the things I didn't mention on these drivers, I, mean, I forgot about that, is the relative value. Not all drivers are created equal. You need to prioritize these. 
and say, for example, re revenue is the most important driver for our company. It's worth twice as much as restaurant adoption, or maybe four times as much. So you need to put relative values on these drivers because they're not created equal. They have different values in the organization. So you need to do that as well. So once you do that, and you've now taken what's in your head as a product manager and put it into a measurement system against the values that the corporation has set, you can now see which of your features have more value to the marketplace according to your opinion as a product manager. Well, now it's time to validate your opinion. And this is a step most of us skip. We think, well, I know my customer. I, I already know that what they want. Therefore, the opinions I voiced in this spreadsheet, that's the answer right there. I'm going like, well, if that's true, then we wouldn't be failing so much. We need to go out and validate. And by validate is you need to go to non-customers, customers, internal teams, everywhere you can go, you need to ask them what they think about these features in my backlog and ask them to rank them. The simplest way of getting customer feedback is ask them to rank. Give them 10 features and, 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 and you know, ask them three or four at a time, which of these do you like best? Which of these do you like best? Which of these? You'd be amazed at how much data you get just by that simple survey of your existing customers and your non-customers. And even what I love doing is sending this to your sales department. I, I kiddingly say if the sales monkeys were running this show, what would your product plan look like? They have an opinion, and their opinion is valuable. They may not be trained as well as you, but I bet you they are very happy to answer the questions about what they would like to see. So getting this com comparative data from multiple constituencies helps you refine your values that you've set before to be more in touch with the real market. And then you got the next step is once you've got all this data, you've got to create a product plan and you got to compare. And in this example, um, this is the shot out of, our, of the product we just released where you can actually create scenarios. And these are scenarios, for example, this is what the product manager thinks, and this is what the sales department thought. And you can, you can have multiple scenarios. You can have multiple scenarios to compare things. And this is where market research doesn't give you the answer, it gives you another piece of data. And so you can sit here and compare different scenarios, compare your features, and try to come up with a, a better scenario that matches each of the constituencies you've got to please. So the one thing I want to point is beware of confirmation bias as you're going through this process. Now, confirmation bias started in World War II. Um, it was actually in, in the, by the British. And the British were sending out bombers to bomb, and they'd come back looking like this, right? And the pilots would get out of the plane and say, look at that, fix that, look how weak that is. It's got a giant hole, make that stronger. And look at the nose is gone. Make the nose stronger. You know, these planes are falling apart. And they were doing all that and it was not helping at all on survivability. And a scientist showed up and said, we're doing this all wrong. You see this airplane here? You leave that alone right here, you make that stronger. And on that wing up there, well, over here, make it stronger here. Because he said, the guys who got shot there didn't make it home. The guys who got shot here and here, they're sitting right here talking to you. We're doing this all wrong, right? We're not looking at the right thing. And we all suffer from confirmational bias. We want to believe what we see instead of stepping back and say, gee, it's a different problem than I think it is. Implement a system of record, critical. You need to have this all documented and why? Because as product managers, half our time is spent convincing engineering that what we want them to build is the right thing. And convincing management that what we want them to build is the right thing. If you put all the information you have into a system of record and have all the data available for people to examine, you now have the backup behind your opinion that makes you look smarter and will help convince those people that you've done your homework and all your work. Let them look at the surveys you did. Let them look at your customer interviews. Have all of that in an easy to find system of record so that the people you have to convince can see you did your job, you did it well, and you have the data to back up the decisions you're proposing. And finally, make it a collaborative process. Most people complain that the product management process is a black box in the organization that they don't understand. You need to open up the kimono and wa have people watch this process so they understand A, how tough your job is, and B, that you've done your homework and you have the data to back up the decisions you're doing. So in summary, right, most products fail. 
the, the data's out there. We would stop kidding ourselves. Um, the current approaches aren't working. They need to be changed. We need new approaches. We need to be self, we need to be introspective and self-reflective on making our job better. We need to change to a market-first mindset in how we do our job. And then finally, we need to create a framework where the product process is part of the corporate process and not just a black box. I think that's the last one. Questions? I just have a question because the product failure is similar to project failure. Is there any correlation between this? And how the agile development influences this product failure where we have the products in the center? I'm getting an echo here. Did someone? I, I, yeah, I, I, let me move over. I was getting an echo from the speaker. <laughs> okay, do you know uh, how this uh, product failure is correlated to uh, project man management failure because it's the scale is similar? I, I don't, yeah. I, I put it more on the product managers, it's the decision people are getting. In the project management area, I think there's a lot of tools that are helping doing the job better, like Jira, for example. I don't put the blame on project managers as much as I do product managers. Okay. And the second question is, uh, does the agile development we have for several years, from your perspective, helps to have better products? It has nothing to do with it, in my opinion. It, it, Agile is a development methodology that works for cer certain kinds of products and it doesn't work for others. Um, for example, if I'm doing a large platform, Agile may not be the best way. If I have a consumer product where I have to iterate every two weeks, it may be the best thing to do. It's not a, it's not a solution to this. The problem with Agile is that the problem is not once you've started building it, doing it wrong. We have plenty of tools, as I said, to help us build the wrong thing better and faster. What we don't have are tools to help us make the right decision in the first place about what we should be building. And that's where the mistakes come in. Everyone's heard of the lean startup concept. We've all probably read the book, right? And what did they say to do? They said, build a minimum viable product and put it out there and then listen to your customers and that'll guide you. And I'm going like, no. The problem with that whole process is the minimum viable product usually is not enough of a product to really solve the customer's problem. So I say, it's gotta be the minimum lovable product, not viable in the first place. And the second is once we start building something, we have this momentum as human beings to not back off because we've made this commitment and we've made this investment and we're gonna fight to make that right. And if it was the wrong thing in the first place, we're just gonna keep making the wrong thing better and better and it's just gonna fail bigger. So we've gotta make the decision about what to do before we write the first line of code. And that's because we've got to deal with people here. And we have, again, people have momentum in their thinking and it leads to confirmational bias because once we've convinced ourselves this is the right thing, we're going to stay focused on that and we're going to make it work no matter what. Questions? Okay. Thank you very much. <laughs>